Thank you, Bob. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you being here to learn more about what's at stake in the Virginia state elections this year and how you can help to keep Virginia blue. My name is Beth Landry. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm the International Secretary for Democrats Abroad. While I'm a Maryland voter, I lived and voted in Virginia for about five years in Arlington, Alexandria, and Prince William County. I know the difference our voices and votes can make for improving the lives of Virginians firsthand. I'm humbled to share this space with you today to hear from two of Virginia's state legislators to find out how it's going on the ground, Delegates Danica Rome and Dawn Adams, both elected in 2017 and have been serving since in the Virginia House of Delegates. Their remarks will be followed by a question and answer session. Joining me are two of our Democrats Abroad LGBTQ plus caucus leaders and webinar organizers. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Bob Valle, LGBTQ plus caucus chair and vice chair of Democrats Abroad Italy, as well as to Martha McDevitt Pugh, Democrats Abroad DNC representative and LGBTQ plus caucus vice chair, member of DA Netherlands. We're also joined by our voter assistance team. Julie Phillips is on the line to hand um, to help answer any voting questions. Please stay on through the end so you can find out more about voting in Virginia and get any questions you may have answered. If you have voting questions, you can also send them by email to info at democratsabroad.org. I'd like to hand it over now to Bob Valle, LGBTQ plus caucus chair. Take it away, well, thank Thank you, Beth, and hello, everyone. Welcome to this event. Uh, uh, Beth is calling me Bob Valier, which you know is what people call me in France. In America, uh, my last name is pronounced Valier, rhymes with queer. Never heard that before ever in my life. So I am the uh, uh, chair of the Global LGBTQ Plus uh, Caucus. I'm also the vice chair of DA Italy. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to this event that the caucus is sponsoring about what's uh, at stake in the Virginia elections. We're very excited to have two great speakers and I'm honored to introduce our first one. Um, Virginia State Delegate Donica Rome represents the 13th district of the Virginia House of Delegates as the first out and seated transgender state legislature, legislator in American history. Elected in 2017 and re-elected in 2019, Delegate Rome is a 36-year-old stepmom, former newspaper reporter, and lifelong resident of the Prince William County part of Manassas, Virginia. She was one of 23 Democrats to flip state legislative seats from red to blue between 2017 and 2019, allowing the Democratic Party to reclaim the majority in both chambers in Virginia for the first time in 20 years. And you may remember that the year before Delegate Rome was elected or the cycle before, it came down to a coin toss, a coin toss, because the last election was tied uh, even after a recount. And so they did a coin toss. The Republican won that coin toss. This, I can't emphasize enough, is why every single vote matters especially votes from abroad. Now in 2018, Delegate Rome was part of the bipartisan coalition that voted to expand Medicaid to what is now 538,000 Virginia adults and growing. That same year, she earned the Prince William Times Reader's Choice Award for Best Local Politician, as well as the Washington Blades Reader's Choice for Local Hero. So how lucky are we to have the best politician and a local hero here with us. During her two terms in office, the governor of Virginia has signed, get this, 23 of Delegate Rome's bills into law. That's quite a record of accomplishment. And some of these bills include, um, well, there's eight, in fact, to prevent school meal debt shaming and three to protect LGBTQ Virginians. Her top priorities include fixing Route 28. I've been on Route 28, it needs fixing. Raising uh, teacher pay, uh, and you know, I am, uh, know lots of teachers and they need more pay, um, and making Virginia a more inclusive uh, commonwealth. So would you please join us now in welcoming Danica Rome, Delegate Rome, the floor is yours. 
Well, and thank you for joining. Off, th thank you so much for inviting me, um, as well as uh, Delegate Adams and Delegate Dr. Adams will be happy to see. I just got my flu shot a minute ago um, over Manassas. So wherever you are in the world, remember to get yours too. Getting vaccinated against COVID is great and awesome. There are other things you also need to get vaccinated against. So make sure you please take care of yourself and each other. Uh, so with that, thank you all so much for having me. I am grateful to represent the people of the city of Manassas Park and the Western Prince William County portions of Haymarket Gainesville, my lifelong home Manassas. I just turned 37 last week, by the way. Uh, so I got to update my, uh, my bio there. And also our Medicaid expansion uh, enrollment uh, numbers is now 588,000 Virginians and counting, which is incredible. That means we are on pace to hit about 600,000 people who will have a quality affordable health insurance by the end of this year. That's what Democrats do when we get into office. We force the issue. In 2017, every House Republican voted in a 66 to 34 party line vote to defeat Medicaid expansion when then Governor Terry McAuliffe tried to amend the budget in order to include it. And Delegate Adams, my first year in office after we won in 2017, and by the way, that was the year that Shelley Simon said the the uh, the, the fishbowl drawing. Uh, so yeah, we were, we were all on the ballot together that year. But uh, that was uh, it's a, it, after 2017 on May 30th, 2018. That's when we voted to uh, expand Medicaid because we had enough Republicans who actually flipped their votes because they saw what happened. They uh, saw that the voters knew they were out of sync and they were willing to unseat Republicans to replace them with Democrats who would make sure that you have health insurance. And my God, what would have happened if we didn't, if we had left more than half a million people uninsured during a worldwide pandemic, that's unconscionable to me. I lived uninsured for two and a half years in my early thirties. Uh, when I was sworn into office, I was still uninsured for next three and a half, for next three weeks after that. I've been down there no one should have to have that. The health insurance that Delegate Adams and I received from the state, that should be the floor. That should be the minimum that everyone is able to receive. We want to make sure everyone has quality, affordable health insurance, no matter where you are throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. So that's uh, just to start with. Now, um, I am so glad to have been a Democrat abroad, as in uh, I've traveled many, many, many times uh, abroad and uh, beginning in 1992, my mom took my sister and I to uh, England and Scotland, and I've uh, loved Scotland ever since. I've been uh, five times. My band actually performed in Glasgow, Edinburgh, and Aberdeen, as well as in Belfast in Northern Ireland in uh, 2012. And um, I studied abroad in Italy in 2005 and returned to Italy in 2013, and I uh, visited my ancestral homeland. Of, of my great grandparents uh, in Moro Locano, uh, which is in, uh, I guess, kind of the uh, the ankle of the boot a little bit, or maybe the calf of the boot of Italy. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous and everything tastes amazing. <laughs> uh, I've been to heavy metal festivals uh, all over Europe, especially uh, Bakken open air in Northern Germany. Still got my wristband on from 2015. It's literally hanging on by threads at this point. <laughs> I've been to Hellfest in Western France twice, God's Metal Festival in, uh, in uh, Bologna, Italy uh, once as well. Uh, and I've been to Amsterdam, I've been to, you know, uh, Belgium, and just, yeah, all over, uh, even Denmark, uh, Finland for a couple of days. Um, I absolutely, I, I love going, you know, and uh, I can't wait until it is safe to travel and, uh, and return again. Uh, and I also even, my, my partner of now seven years is also a uh, Finnish immigrant, actually. So um, that's, uh, that is very fun. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, if you think that uh, Dr. Adams is introverted, uh, and she is, uh, that's nothing compared to our immigrant fins. Trust me on this. <laughs> that the immigrant fin is the Rubik's cube that must be solved by those of us who are extroverts. <laughs> so um, I, I'll, I'll tell you though, um, the things that we have done since our democratic majority took over in 2020 have been nothing short of fundamentally transforming Virginia for the best. Since Delegate Adams and I became uh, members of the majority in January 2020 after serving two years in the minority party, we have now passed two dozen pro-LGBTQ equality bills across the board, including bill from Delegate Adams that deals with you know, senior care. I'm sure uh, she'll be able to elaborate on that a little bit more later. Don't want to steal your thunder too much. That's a very important uh, bill for a lot of people who tend to be very overlooked, which is our LGBTQ seniors. That's a very big deal for them. And we've passed my bills to uh, ban the gay trans panic defense uh, in Virginia. And two months after that bill was signed, there was a murder in Blacksburg where that where the attorney of the accused actually you know, tried to invoke that in the press. And because of that bill we passed, 
they will not be able to do that in court when uh, once the trial actually begins. That will not, uh, the judge will give instruction to the jury to disregard that in terms of determining anything that regards that regards sentencing. So that that's one thing. Uh, we passed my bill to eliminate discrimination against trans people on health insurance. It happened to me in 2014. And now because of that, there's a trans guy in Roanoke who got his top surgery covered. And he's, by the way, and he has Medicaid and he's en enrolled in Medicaid because of Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid expansion provided his health insurance needs. And my bill defines trans care as medically necessary because it is. This is not cosmetic, it is not elective. We are following our doctor's orders. And that is important. And especially for our dear re uh, registered nurse on this uh, call today, who can very much uh, tell you that, you know, like making sure that you're working with and carrying out the prescriptions and the recommendations of your doctors, that's that's what we need to do. We're following our doctor's orders. We gotta do what we gotta do. Um, so we also passed my bill that allows uh, localities to include sexual orientation, gender identity, and their local non-discrimination ordinances. And I want you to think back to, uh, especially since uh, one of our, uh, you know, a panelist here uh, lived in Prince William County for a bit, Beth. Uh, remember when Prince William was a nationwide leader in being hostile to immigrants in 2007, and the same people who were hostile to immigrants were hostile to LGBTQ people. My predecessor, who had been elected 13 times, was in the House of Delegates for 26 years, since I was seven years old until I was 33 when we finally unseated him in 2017. He was the self-described chief homophobe of Virginia, who had filed a bathroom bill, among many, many, many other bills uh, that were directly targeted against you know, our people and our community. And now look what's changed. We have gone from being one of the most hostile states in the country toward LGBTQ people, where in 2016, House Republicans filed nine anti-LGBTQ bills alone to now being a nationwide leader in inclusive pro-LGBTQ equality legislation and public policy. How incredible is that? That is strictly and exclusively because we have Democratic majorities. When Delegate Kirk Cox was Speaker of the House, he killed all but one LGBTQ bills that went to the House floor, all of them he made sure died in subcommittee or would not even get a hearing. And the only one that did get there was to make surrogacy laws gender neutral because the former chief of staff of former Republican Senator George Allen was the one who was requesting it. That's the only reason no one even got to the floor. And that was a huge internal fight on the uh, Republican side between figuring out whether they are uh, more anti-gay or anti-abortion. It was kind of a little well, Coin, coin flip for them on <laughs> that one. So uh, anyway, though, uh, what we've also done since we've been in the majority, we passed historic transportation infrastructure funding for the you know largest transportation funding bill in 36, or since 1986, I should say, so it's been 35 years that we actually got done um, with uh, the Speaker of the House, Eileen Fillercorn's uh, HP 1414. And you know, when we talked about my 23 bill signage law, we've done more with you know increasing transparency in government, by the way, which is a big thing that Republicans were blocking for a long time. I'm really proud that, you know, as a reporter turned legislator, I've been able to lead on making sure we have more transparent government. And as we've been doing it, we've also made Virginia a nationwide leader in voting rights. My God, the former capital of the Confederacy is now one of the easiest states to vote in. <laughs> Who knew? That's on the ballot this fall. And by which I mean. We have to have our democratic majority win and stay in power in order for us to give second and final passage next year to a, uh, to a uh, resolution that would call for a referendum for us to actually have automatic voting rights uh, restoration. That's so important. And you know, the other constitutional amendment that our democratic majority will be able to put forward to the voters next year, as long as we keep our democratic majority, the, we are going to repeal and replace Marshall Newman the state constitution ban against marriage equality, and we will replace it with an affirmative right to marry because, well, that's what the Supreme Court ruled. <laughs> we should already be doing this, but that's a legacy for my predecessor. We've already repealed the Marshall part of that. Let's repeal his actual piece of public policy to go along with it. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say here is campaigns are inherently about contrast. That's what they are, is you have your choices, pick one. And in my race, my challenger wants to kick all undocumented kids out of school from kindergarten through college. But not only has that been unconstitutional since Plyer versus Doe in 1982, that is barbaric, horrible public policy. 
these children didn't choose to come here, but they are here. Treat them as members of their of the community. You want to see what happened. The worst thing that you can do is single out and stigmatize the most vulnerable people you're running to serve in the first place. And they are my constituents, and I will always fight for my constituents. My challenger in this race opposes abortion in all cases, including cases where you could have a minor who is a survivor of sexual assault. And my challenger would side with the rapist who impregnated that young person if that rapist is someone who wanted to keep that, you know, basically keep that pregnancy as opposed to the will of the survivor of sexual assault. That is on the ballot this fall. And he actually did answer a question in a questionnaire where he says he's opposed to abortion at all times. That means without exception. That's just, again, horrible, unconstitutional public policy. And on top of that, he's against marriage equality, against LGBTQ adoption, supports bathroom bills, as if the message my voters sent in 2017 wasn't enough on that one, and opposes all of the non-discrimination bills that we've passed, including non-discrimination for gender identity and sexual orientation in healthcare, in, in employment, in housing, in credit, so much else. That's the contrast in my race. We are doing extraordinarily well right now. We are beating him in every single aspect of this campaign. And at the same time, we know that because the Republicans have unlimited amount of money at the top of the ticket, we have to go full throttle for the remainder of this campaign. We are not going to be easy on him. We are not going to go light. We are going to make sure that my constituents know on the public policy issues, they're not personal attacks, public policy issues, the differences in this race. And I am grateful to continue serving my lifelong home community of Western Prince William County. And I was just named, by the way, here, this year in 2021, Inside Nova's uh, best public servant for Prince William County. And next week, uh, the Prince William Times will be unveiling that I was just named for a second time in four years, Prince William County's best local politician as well. So I'm really, really grateful that the people of the 13th district took a chance on the trans metalhead journalist from Manassas in the first place four years ago. And apparently they like the job I'm doing. So let's make sure we keep it going. And I would just be grateful if uh, any of y'all could really help us out. I'll throw my Act Blue link in the chat in uh, just a minute here. And also please, please, please support Dawn Adams because not only is she a legitimate dear friend who I can talk about non-politic stuff, we both love Outlander, so that's a good example. <laughs> but she was also so kind. She put me up at her home during a, our first session in Richmond together in 2018. And she, what I love with Dawn is she has a complete inability to BS anyone. She is the most honest person in the world who you will ever meet. I adore Dawn Adams and I have to see her get reelected. So Dawn, whenever you need me to come down to Richmond in the next four weeks, you got me at your disposal. Let's go in. Wow, great, thanks. It's no surprise at all that you're being named the best local politician again for a second time because listening to the things you have accomplished in the four years that you've been in the House of Delegates and the things that you have planned for the next how many ever years you're there before you're elected governor um, uh, is really, really inspiring. Very impressive, excellent. And if I had known that you were a metalhead, you know, I would have invited my cousin's band, his, it's Nagazi. Um, to to come play for you or or no, no, no. you said Fugazi as in the DC no, 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 punk no. hardcore band from the 80s no Nagazi oh 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 <laughs> I, I, <were laughs> I was gonna say we could talk about it. No, I, I might be doing something different or my French neighbors band who always plays at the festivals you were talking about going to uh, the decline of the eye so I hey, would hey there's missed. a great there's two great French bands I'll hook you up with one's called Alceste and the other mm -hmm. one is called uh, Gojira so mm -hmm. check out those right. two French fans. We'll check them out. Um, oh, we do have a, a couple of questions in the chat box, both of which pertain to voting rights. But before I get to those, I wanted to ask um, what you think about the state of the top of the ticket. You alluded to it's going to be tough. Uh, we have our Democratic candidate, former governor, future governor, Terry McAuliffe, uh, facing off against somebody who sounds an awful lot like your opponent um, as well. So how do you feel about... Uh, the situation in Virginia, both sort of at the top of the ticket and in terms of retaining the, the House of Delegates. Well, overall. what I will say about our House of Delegates is most of our Democratic incumbents are actually outrunning the top of the ticket because our record in the House of Delegates has been so impressive. 
so many people are really happy with the job that we are, that we've done. Uh, we have very few, if any, um, House de Democrats who are currently uh, trailing in their races right now. You know, among our incumbents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm actually a very, very, you know, whereas a lot of people are really kind of like, oh, you know, they're kind of sounding alarms and stuff. I'm actually really bullish. We very well mm -hmm. could pick up seats in the House of Delegates because we've got some strong candidates like Katie Sponsler and Deborah Gardner, by the way, who are running it in like kind of south of Richmond area, uh, Chesterfield, really actually well, really greater Chesterfield more or less. Um, so I'm actually really excited about them. And I think our incumbents right now, including uh, Delegate Adams, who was originally one of the 13 RSLC targets uh, when, at the start of the campaign, well, the RSLC has been calling their list and they just dropped Don from it. <laughs> and that's because she, here's what, there's two things you need to know about Don Abs. No, number one, no one hoards their money like she does. She does everything herself, but she's so good at running a campaign. And number two, Pete, her voters show up. Her turnout is ridiculous. Every <laughs> primary, every election, her people show up like, way more than 10,000 more of her voters come out than mine. And I win by a healthy margin. Her people show up, they love her. So I'm just, I'm just telling you, uh, I'm, I'm really bullish about our House of Delegates members because we've done a good job. Why, why shouldn't we be reelected? At the same time, in my race, you know, um, both Terry McAuliffe and I, you know, we're winning my district, but I'm out running him by eight points at the top of the ticket. And that was based on my summer poll. You know, we haven't even done our tracker yet. So, you know, that's one thing where it's like, look, the misnomer that is common in modern politics is that we are so divided as a country that people are just going to be party line voters. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. there are still a lot of ticket splitters who are left. I know that because my predecessor's top ideological ally on the Board of County Supervisors, who is very discriminatory, her and I have a lot of crossover vote in Gainesville. And if someone can please find those voters for me and explain that, I, I would love to know. But that's reality. And that's my district is that you can have people with two very different worldviews where people are like, you know what? I like you on land use. And I like you on healthcare and infrastructure. Yep, both of you are going to get my votes. And I'm going to go, ha, ah, that's politics. It's when you get local, party ID stuff starts going out the door a bit. It's my neighbor. Oh, you were at, you covered my kids' football games for eight years. Oh, I saw you at this one. I saw you at Haymarket Day. You seemed really kind. That will vary. Oh, you came to my door. And that's the first one always. That trumps party ID very often. Do not forget all politics is hyper local if you make it so. So that's just one thing I would tell you is I still believe our statewide Democrats will sweep this year. I'm very bullish on Hala Yala. She is, you know, our classmate from 2017. Uh, I think she's going to do a phenomenal job because, you know, her challenger is as some really bad views that are completely out of sync with Virginia. And Mark Herring's running for a third term as attorney general. I think he'll be just fine. Terry's got a real race. He's got a real race. He is up in just about every poll, all but one of the public ones. And I know he's up in the internals as well. But at the same time, you know, people forget that aside from Terry in 2013, Virginia always votes uh, for governor, the opposite party of whoever's in the White House. That this year is not any different in that regard. The only thing that's changed is that the demographics of Virginia have changed and Northern Virginia's influence has become so much larger than it was a decade ago that we're actually in a place to weather that storm under a different turnout model than we had in 2017 and a turnout model that's much more like what we saw in 2013, for example. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think we'll weather the storm. I think we'll be okay. And at the same time, you, if you live in Virginia and you're on this call, you have to vote. You've absolutely got to vote. Um, and by the, oh. for the two questions that were um, in the chat, I'll take these really quick. Well, um, let me let me let me introduce them because I got a sure. good segue into them. You know, we've got it's an important statistic as well. We've got about five thousand two hundred Virginia voters who live abroad. 
and we're doing everything we can to make sure that every single one of them is going to return a ballot. Um, some of them are going to be in your district. Some of them are going to be in Don's district. All of them are hopefully going to vote for Terry McAuliffe. So we're calling everybody. We're emailing everybody. We're getting out the vote as much as we can. 5,200 people. Um, but for some people, especially this past pandemic year, it's really difficult because Virginia uh, only allows postal return on their ballots. So what do you think about electronic ballot return? Do you think it's possible that Virginia could um, alter its uh, election laws to make it easier for people like us who live abroad to get those ballots back either by email return or by fax? I would say, but I would, I will tell you two things. Number one, we still got a couple more things domestically that are on the agenda that we've got to take care of. And we just being blunt with you that we are going to prioritize with our continued democratic majority, uh, that constitutional amendment for, uh, you know, for, you know, re restoration of rights to end that automatic disenfranchisement of people. That's, that's number one priority in terms of what's left. Number two, we've passed more than a dozen voter access bills in the last couple of years. Whereas the rest of the, you know, the, the rest of the South, it seems like is trying to make it as difficult as possible to, you know, for people to vote. We've actually now become a nationwide leader in voting rights, like I was saying before. That's amazing. It's some of the stuff we're able to do. So I think it's actually in terms of enfranchising at all of our overseas, you know, American citizens who are 18 years of age and legally registered to vote. Yes, we should make that as easy as possible for you to be able to cast your ballot. No question. And especially when we were dealing with, you know, members of the military, for example, that's the easiest one where we get to point to them, right? Because we're talking about people who are stationed very often in places that are very remote, um, you know, for example. So that's the first thing to mention. Second thing to mention with this is in terms of electronic returns of general election ballots, Virginia is a paper ballot state. So we do, we run our our ballots through optical scan machines. We used to do electronic voting due to a number of concerns that people had about, you know, basically whether electronic machines could be hacked or, or anything else is that basically that, that comes with internet connectivity. I think if you had a very thorough way that where someone can go in front of the House uh, Privileges and Elections Committee and really demonstrate the security behind and integrity behind someone's vote, not to be confused with the manufactured outrage of non-existent, you know, massive voter fraud throughout Virginia right now, where our audits that we had showed more than 99.999%, you know, accuracy in terms of returns, but in terms of making sure that an electronic ballot is safe and secure for an abroad voter, if someone can make that presentation to the PE committee that Delegate Adams sits on, and I do not, <laughs> then perhaps the PE committee will be will act favorably upon it, and only then would it I would be able to consider it on the House floor. But you're going to have to convince uh, Delegate Adams before you convince me. <laughs> well, that's really great news, and you know if Delegate Adams needs to subpoena some people in order to testify to that committee, we've got a whole lot of experts here. Um, and, you know, you sort of have indirectly answered the other question uh, as well, because you're so um, much an advocate for voter access. Uh, not all states allow us to vote on, uh, how did Merrill phrase it here, um, uh, the right to vote in down ballot elections. So, you know, I can't vote for dog catcher in my hometown of Flushing, Michigan, um, although I could and I probably went to high school with them anyway. So, um, uh, but not all states allow that. So would you, would you um, as part of that uh, PE uh, testimony, be uh, open to the idea. This, this, this is very simple. If you can cast a ballot in any given election, you should be able to cast a ballot in all elections. If you have a registered address that is your legal address that is in the United States, and just because you're abroad, absolutely you should be able to cast your uh, your ballot as an American citizen who legally resides in the United States. That's very, very simple. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't see any, uh, you know, just if you can already vote in federal elections, of course you should be able to vote in state and local elections. Of course you should. There's, I mean, that's, that's, that's obvious. So you just won hundreds of thousands of, of fans, adoring fans in Democrats <laughs> abroad for your strong support for voter And access. keep in mind, just to really emphasize that, we're talking about American citizens who are over the age of 18, who are legally entitled to cast a ballot in some races, yes, should be able to cast ballots in all their races. 
this is basic. You, uh, the, the Constitution is not designed for some enfranchisement. It's for all enfranchisement. That's the point of this. And uh, at this point, I will uh, graciously uh, bid the remainder of my time to my colleague, uh, but only if you go into the chat right now and you click that little link that I just put in there, because that is a wonderful <laughs> hot place for you to stop by and look real, real good going into these last four weeks. Make sure you put an American address in because that's really also important, you know, legal. Yeah, uh, we know Axe Blue quite well. Um, <laughs> and if we put in a foreign address, they will send us a request for our passport. So um, uh, no problems there. We do it all the time. So thank you so much for a really just very enthusiastic assessment of what's going on in Virginia and what's ahead of us. It was really fantastic. And I think, like I said, you, you, you've won a lot of fans here in Democrats Abroad. I'm gonna stop talking now and let my dear colleague Martha take over to introduce your colleague, uh, Delegate Adams. Thanks so much again. Thank you, Bob. Well, it's my honor to introduce Virginia Delegate Don Adams. Delegate Adams is a doctorally prepared nurse practitioner with nearly 35 years of diverse clinical and administrative healthcare experience. Dawn was first selected at the House of Delegates in 2017, as we already heard, and she is the first and only open, open lesbian legislator and openly LGBT representative from outside of Northern Virginia in the Commonwealth's 400 year history. Her legislative focus is healthcare, particularly around issues affecting elderly and vulnerable populations and creating solutions to increase access and drive down the cost of healthcare. I think we'd also like to hear uh, from Delegate Adams her own questions, uh, answer to some of the questions we have. But for now, I'm going to ask you all to please join me in welcoming Don Adams. And Delegate Adams, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Well, a better politician would be threatened by having Danica in front. Uh, <laughs> But I am not a great politician. I am a great policy person. Uh, I, I really um, uh, just, as you can see, uh, you know, admire uh, Delegate Rome so much. She's so generous and uh, probably more than she needs to be. So you can see why she has won a service award after service award. Um, you know, her predecessor, uh, the reason he was able to do so well is he, he the one thing, even though he was an incredible bigot, uh, was uh, do constituent services, and she has outshined him uh, by far. So Prince William County is certainly lucky to have Delegate Rome, as we all are. Um, you know, for me, I, I represent Richmond City, part of Richmond City, uh, Northern Chesterfield, and, and, and approximately three uh, precincts of Enrico. They, these are all suburbs of Richmond City. Um, it has historically been a Republican area, um, uh, like so much of Virginia. And, uh, you know, I think currently is still fairly purple, um, uh, you know, at least at the local levels. Um, I really focus on healthcare legislation because, you know, one of the great things about Virginia delegation is we are a, a part-time legislator legislature made up of citizens who have diverse backgrounds. So um, I really think that's super important that we have um, social workers and pharmacists and newspaper reporters and, uh, you know, um, nur nurses and, 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 agri you know, farmers and just, just all kinds of diversity in our legislature, because that's what makes Virginia, Virginia. I think what has been uh, new in 2017 is, um, you know, we, we are lucky to see uh, gender uh, be a part of the conversation and sexuality be part of the conversation, only in that um, these are underrepresented populations of, of Virginia. And, and so we've kind of normalized that a bit. Um, as you can see, uh, Delegate uh, Rome is an extrovert and I uh, am not an extrovert. And uh, so yeah, I tend to really uh, be kind of in the weeds uh, as she is too, but also just a little more um, focused on the, the backroom conversations, I guess, uh, you know, uh, trying to build relationships to, to sort of get through these like uh, dense policy decisions around access to healthcare and driving down the cost. Because the reality in healthcare is the big players don't want to drive down the cost. The big players want to keep things the same because they're profitable. You know, other systems uh, internationally uh, have much better healthcare system uh, coverage because 
um, you know, they, they see the value inherently in uh, ensuring that we have things like preventative and primary care. Uh, America does trauma care great. They do everything else less than great. Um, and that's because, uh, you know, we're a for-profit healthcare system. So, you know, I try to focus on uh, ways that we can reduce costs that can be considered kind of small, uh, but, but for the communities in which um, they affect, they're great. So making sure that people can practice to the fullest extent of their education, making sure that uh, LGBT and uh, HIV positive uh, older populations are seen. Uh, which you know, I'm 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 quite a bit older than uh, Delegate Rome, and so um, you know, many people from my generation and older, you know, aren't used to being seen or are uncomfortable being seen, or or when they're seen, they feel discomfort. And so, making sure that that population is accounted for as we look to provide resources, uh, particularly health related and and quality of life resources. Um, I, I think that, you know, Virginia has come just uh, so far, uh, but without voices like Delegate Rome and myself, uh, as well as uh, Delegate Sickles and Delegate Levine and uh, Senator Eben, which are, you know, the, the entirety of the LGBTQ caucus uh, for the, the uh, General Assembly, um, you know, people would not understand why it's so important that we have equality uh, in our ability to seek housing and employment fairly, to seek uh, health care fairly. Um, you know, without our voices, uh, people wouldn't understand why reproductive rights are for all people, whether you're cis or trans. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, we have to get past the little annoying things where they say male, female, or other. That's just a stupid, stupid uh, a way to phrase it. But, but we, what we are doing is educating people, um, you know, that all people are people. Um, and that uh, we we feel that um, we need to get beyond some of these labels and just start treating uh, each other with love and kindness, even in our policy. And so a lot of what I try to focus on is uh, uh, in a kind of, I guess, softer way, the love and kindness of policy, uh, because I feel that um, if we better understood one another, we would do better by each other. And so, uh, you know, I think also, you know, I, I focused on really small, like um, a policy that had to do with um, pulling people out of their, you know, whatever it is they're doing and charging them with uh, like minor charges because um, really as a front to uh, harassing people of color. Uh, I, so in 2020, I, I have a whole host of bills that I put in uh, that were really precursors to, um, just uh, uh, minority harassment. And so, uh, we, you know, we got those things changed. We, you know, both Delegate uh, uh, Rome and I believe that there needs to be campaign finance reform. We believe in transparency. We believe in uh, reproductive rights. We believe in voter access at, you know, in, at every level. We believe in um, making sure that people have health care. We believe that kids get school lunches. We, we believe in things that affect people's basic quality of life. We believe in helping the environment. You know, our kids are going to be walking on a planet that's 140 degrees if we do nothing. You know, we can't afford that. We have to intervene and we have to do it drastically. And I think, you know, these are some places um, that we just need to do better as Virginians and Americans. And I think sometimes when you have an international lens, you can see that more readily than um, those of us who have stayed primarily, you know, uh, with the lens of an American and, and, and particularly a privileged American. So, you know, what we're fighting for in Virginia is, is just, um, you know, really this very uh, kinder, more fair way of engaging in policy. And, and uh, I think, you know, many of us, especially Democrats, really, truly believe that we are on the right path. Um, I think many of the citizens that we talk to at the doors uh, believe also that we're on the right path. I think there are some people who feel like we've gone too far. And when I start to explain or other people start to explain that, you know, we're just right sizing inertia of 20 30 years, you know, where people did nothing to sort of equivocate policy with the 21st century, um, then people start to understand that, you know, we haven't gone too far, we just moved the ball. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that we worry about and struggle with, uh, I, I, I tend not, not to be as optimistic or bullish, uh, maybe, uh, as, as my uh, colleague, but, but the reason is because, you know, I feel like sometimes when you're fat and happy, you forget 
uh, what the needs are. And we made such a great, uh, great strides in 2020 and 2021 um, that we need to make sure that we have the enthusiasm at, at our at our backs um, that people do vote. I think if we vote, we win. Uh, but it's so important to get people to understand that these are baby policies. These aren't you know policies that will be difficult to reverse at all. Um, everything that we have done, we have in the in the, it seems like Virginia for some reason has become the new South. You know everything that we have done. Um, other other especially southern states have have done the opposite. So we're really um, you know very much um, forward thinking. I think uh, labels like progressive have kind of gotten tainted. I, I like to see uh, see us being future forward, and that's how I see Virginia. You know we are trying to make things. Um, both good for families and individuals, as well as uh, business opportunities, uh, good for workers uh, and good for um, moms. You know, we we want a fair Virginia for everyone. That's what makes um, the, the class of 2017 in particular kind of special. Um, we, we bound together uh, in many ways, even though we didn't know each other. Uh, and we came together and we voted on things that were principled and we moved the needle in a different way for Virginia. And I think that has, you know, um, been a catalyst for so much of what we were able to change in 2020 and 2021. So, um, you know, if there are questions, great. I, I won't take up any more time, but in general, uh, I, I will just tell you, you know, you couldn't meet a better person than Delegate Rome, um, you know, give her money because she does great things with it. Um, you know, I think the world of her and, uh, you know, we, we are really are working uh, our very hardest to do right by, by everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Delegate Adams. And I'm so glad you mentioned the, um, the, the class of 2017 and the election that was the not quite, but later fulfilled start of the, of the blue wave. Um, it's one of the stories that we always tell as Democrats abroad is that we know that when we get every vote in, we can help with elections that have uh, that have really tight margins. And um, in the case of Virginia, a lot of Virginia voters who live abroad can vote all the way down ballot, but not all of them. And that's something that we really want to want to do something about. Did you have any thoughts on how we could expand um, access to the ballot or um, allow Americans abroad um, to vote in state elections? Yeah, so I think that, you know, in general, like all policy, awareness is key, right? Awareness that there's an issue, making sure that other members of the assembly understand that there is a significant population looking to vote. Um, you know, we also need to make sure that we have the capacity to assure uh, security because that has become, um, you know, more than than a reality, it, it's become a buzz a buzzword, right? It's it's. Uh, I think, you know, I even my opponent constantly is like, oh, you, we should have voter access, but we need uh, security. As if, uh, you know, to me, if you said I need a bologna sandwich six times, I would think you were hungry. So, um, you know, this this is the same sort of principle. You know, we keep hearing, yes, voter access is great, but we need to make sure there's security. What we have shown, uh, you know, through the audit. Um, you know, that we had back in March of 2020 is that was, we have security uh, and we have a constitutional obligation to audit uh, a risk limited audit, but still an annual audit. So um, we have election security. We, we do have some, you know, there has been concerns uh, in terms of how do you uh, suss out the, um, the reliability of, of, of uh, different methods of voting uh, for our military, for example, that are abroad. So, so we want to make sure that um, it's secure, but I think that it starts with awareness. When you talk about, you know, basically, you know, more than 5,000 disenfranchised voters in, in a way, that starts to become real numbers. And so I think that's just where we have to start. I certainly think um, exactly like Delegate Rome, that um, if you're a, a citizen of Virginia, uh, you, you need to, and you have an address in Virginia and you're over 18, you, you should be allowed to vote full stop. Yeah, right. Yeah. So 6 million Americans live abroad. So there's a lot of Virginians that we hope to reach also with this live stream yeah. and remind them that it's uh, there's an election coming up and they still have time to request a ballot and turn it in. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much. Um, 
So I think I think those were our questions. I I just wondered if either of you has any final words for our because um, we're going to go over into voter assistance, which is our very nerdy question and answer session for Virginia voters who may have questions about how to get their ballot back in. But do you have any final words for our Virginia voters on how important it is that they get their ballot in as soon as possible? Hey, sure, um, I'll take the first uh, step. This uh, so. In terms of getting your uh, your vote in as soon as possible, that is absolutely imperative. If any of you are going to be home, you know, in the next four weeks, by the way, if you're going to you know come back to you know uh, stateside, um, it's never been easier to return your ballot. So if it was sent to you in Europe and you don't want to mail it back for whatever reason because you don't trust uh, DeJoy or, or whatever other reasons you have, we have drop boxes all over Virginia where you can physically return your absentee ballot. So that is a thing that we do. Um, that actually Delegate Adams and I voted for. Um, and I'm really proud that our Virginians use them. They really put them to use last year and they're using them again this year. So drop boxes are available. If you wanna vote in person, uh, or we eliminated excuses. You can now just vote because you feel like it. You know, the government should work on your time, not the other way around. Um, and, you know, so it's never been easier to actually cast your ballot. Um, and at the same time, we also voted for the postage that it yeah. takes now. So for you abroad on this, we've eliminated the modern day poll tax. If you yeah. want to go vote, go vote. <laughs> That's it. You know, this is, it, it, again, in our Virginia's 402 year history, number one, Delegate Adams and I were not supposed to be here according to the people who originally set up that system, but we're here. And number two, you weren't supposed to be able to vote this easily. Well, guess what? We're here. And now you can. <laughs> so make sure you put it to use. Yeah. Also, um, I want to uh, read one thing that was uh, left in the chat from uh, Katie Solomon of the DNC here, um, where you wrote, uh, "Our ERA task force worked so hard in Virginia in order to uh, in order for the uh, ERA to be ratified. We sent 5,000 plus postcards in Virginia, tons of phone banking, worked with the ERA groups in Virginia. We know our votes made a difference in 2019 and can again this year. We're working for Virginia, whether or not we're there. One, thank you for the work you did." And two, um, equality isn't just a, you know, uh, isn't just a value statement uh, for me personally. It's quite literally a part of who I am. Um, as you'll see my ERA uh, tattoo that says equality rights under law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Um, maybe I should add in uh, our other nationality, I suppose, but <laughs> uh, just to help out where everyone else is abroad. But I'll tell you, um, getting that done, and that was one of the happiest days I think we've had in the House Delegates floor where Delegate Adams and I, we were able to hit that green button. We looked up in the House gallery and we saw so many elated people, especially women who were just overjoyed after their decades of advocacy. It shouldn't have taken as long as it did. We still have to get Congress to uh, do one thing for us since, um, even though I disagree that the preamble having the date for ratification should uh, matter, it shouldn't um, because that's not part of the constitution. Um, at the same time, I also think very much that, you know, we've got to get uh, Congress to, you know, take care of that part for us and get this thing into the books. But also don't stop with your other state. There's 12 others that should still do it anyway, because it's the right thing to do. You know, Mississippi was the last state to uh, ratify the amendment banning slavery. Uh, well into the 20th century. <laughs> so you really want all 50 states on board uh, at some point for a lot of these. Just say it's a good luck when you do, when you're on the right side of history and the ERA happens to be one of those. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to say otherwise uh, that I am very, very, very glad to see so many of y'all who, um, who are a part of this today. I'm so glad to see... Um, a number of y'all here who are um, so supportive of what Delegate Adams and I are trying to do and continuing to do. And Delegate Adams is too humble to speak on uh, on the number of bills she's passed, but uh, I think you've actually, you might have even eclipsed my 23. I think <laughs> your, your record's been uh, pretty damn good. And uh, you weren't uh, frozen out quite like I was my first year. I think you got one or two uh, across the finish line. <laughs> I was at the, I was on the kill list of my, our, our first year, but uh, you know, I got to defrost that list uh, you know, after they put me in the ice box the first year, I got three done my second year, 14 done year three and six done this year. So, you know, it's pretty good. And um, the last thing I just want to mention here is to all of you who are our LGBTQ Dems abroad, you know, you know 
you know how hard it has been just in our own country for us to get where we are. And you've seen abroad that unless you're in like Iceland where things are apparently amazing, <laughs> uh, aside from that, it's been a struggle. It has been a struggle so many places for basic equality where there are still places abroad where you can be legally executed, let alone outcast, let alone hurt, imprisoned, anything else with that for simply existing as an LGBTQ person. Yeah. The United States of America has to lead on equality because when we do, other nations follow our steps. And in order for the United States to lead, we have to lead in the states. And when Virginia leads on this, when we are showing the rest of the South, here's how it's done. South is not just some insignificant Republican wasteland or something. We are a very highly populated area of the country. Virginia leading the way will eventually lead to North Carolina doing the right thing, to Georgia doing the right thing, and to other states following suit. Do not undersell the importance of what we do in Virginia on equality and in terms of making our Virginia more inclusive commonwealth. Because as we do it in Virginia, other states across the country look at us and say, if they're doing it in Virginia, then surely we can do it as well. Yeah, and I want that, you all that, to remember that. To that end, you know, I want to mention that we have a state senator, Gen Senator Jennifer McClellan. She's amazing. She ran for governor. There's a picture of her with our governor, Governor Northam, and she's crying after, uh, you know, finally getting the emancipation um, statue erected. She had worked on it for years. And I think she's crying for very much the same reasons that, you know, I did unexpectedly when we passed the Virginia Values Act, I burst into tears when I hugged uh, Delegate Sickles and I didn't expect it, but you're just holding in all this oppression for a lifetime. And then when you finally realize that, you know, somehow you're seen as potentially equal, it is just like a release. Um, and, you know, this is still here. This is this kind of discrimination. I mean, Delegate Rome gets it every day too. I mean, just people hate us for being, you know, lesbian or trans for like, they don't even know us. And they're constantly like, we freaking hate you because you're you. You know, when you are able to pass policy that surpasses that, that young people, young people get to see that there's hope for their future where they don't have to commit suicide because they feel so shitty about being, you know, LGBTQ. This is, this is, this is what makes it possible for an introvert who hates campaigning to be out here fighting every day because I freaking hate campaigning, but I love policy. I love that a child isn't going to have to feel like I felt I love that a young 20 year old isn't going to have to feel like I felt. I love that we can reduce the suicide rate just because we love you enough to see you. And it's the most amazing thing. And only we know this, you know, or only oppressed groups really understand that this is significant in ways that we couldn't otherwise like share. And so I'm so grateful that, you know, to be a part of all of this and to put forth these policies, this is why we have to have Dems vote. This is why we need your vote. This is why we need your help. This is what we're doing it for. We're doing it for our future and for our kids and for our young people and for our young people who are, are feeling unseen. I think that's the ending that we want to have to this conversation tonight. That was fantastic. And that dear friends, is what's at stake in the Virginia election and every single election. That's why every vote matters. So if you're a Virginia voter on the call tonight, make sure you're registered, make sure you've requested your absentee ballot, make sure you return it, make sure you vote for these two wonderful people. We're a little bit over time, but you know what? Who cares? When you're listening to a great politician and an expert policy wonk, who cares about time, right? Um, uh, but now, if this was not a convincing argument for why you have to vote in every single election you can, I cannot think of a better one. So thank you, thank you, thank you to both of you. Um, this was fantastic. You know, when you're ready to run for Congress, when you're ready to run for the State House, let us know. We don't have a lot of money um, in Democrats abroad, but we do have a lot of enthusiasm and we know how to mobilize our people. So. If you need help, just say the word and we'll be there for you. Thanks so much to both of you. 
um, uh, everyone, you know, give the hands up, the fingers up, the claps, whatever else uh, I, emojis you want to include there in the chat box. This was uh, fantastic. Um, we're going to uh, move into a portion now for voter assistance.